Hello, hello, and welcome to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2. And as you can probably guess by this sort of swirly thing that's going on on the screen at the moment, we're going to start off by taking a little bit of a look at the endgame puzzle. So if you're still trying to avoid spoilers on that one and you don't want to know about all the, um, well, all of the archaeology, should we say, then make sure you skip the next chapter and jump to the one called Science, because then I'm going to start talking about things that are a bit more, um, a bit more standard Factorio and a bit less endgame puzzle. And so continuing on with the uh, with the pyramid discovery and ransacking, Tristan has been off to various planets around the uh, around the universe, and I couldn't tell you where any of them are because they're all going to be hidden off in various different uh, star systems, and I don't have that list uh, available for me. However, I can tell you that he's been to Virus, Mordred, Eclades, Conan, Shara, Kuyu, Tartarus, and Kuma, from which he's picked up three efficiency modules, three speed, and two productivities. And I'm sure that means he's going to come over and put all of those into the uh, labs over here. Yes, he has. So you can see now we are we are completely filled up with tier nine productivity modules here. All of these are tier nine. So we've, we've, we've gained eight of them from uh, for this one, another eight for this one. So we've gained 16 productivity modules from our pyramid explorations. That's pretty good. We've got a decent number of those. And we've also been putting the speed modules into this beacon here, which means that all of these machines will run significantly faster. Now, this is slightly wasteful. What we should actually be doing is putting in one of the compact beacon, well a compact beacon 2 in probably here or here, doesn't matter which. So it covers both of the labs and then you get double the effectiveness coming over from each module. If we look at the stats down here, you can see that the Compact Beacon 2 will take in 10 module slots and gives you 100% transmission efficiency of those. So you put in 10 modules and everything they do goes through, but only over a small area. The Wide Area Beacon 2s do 20 module slots of 50% of transmission efficiency. So they've got the same amount of overall power, but they require twice as many modules, but can affect a far larger area. So, so comparing this again, you can see this, this has yeah, a very, very small area, hence it's called the Compact Beacon, um, but it's enough to cover both of those, both of these two labs here. If we switch over to the Wide Area Beacon 2, you can see it has a much, much wider area that it covers, but you only get 50% of the module effectiveness through, but you get to put in twice as many. So overall, you get the same effectiveness, but it takes a lot more modules. So in a case like this, where the modules are quite rare and quite expensive, we would be significantly better off with a Compact Beacon in there. Although, that said, is this affecting anything else? Yeah, this is actually, that said, this is also affecting all of those machines down there that are making the significant data. And so I suppose there's a, a certain amount of use for that as well. Maybe, although we could, we could move this beacon down to, yeah, I guess down to about here probably, to affect some more of the significant data production machines whilst not doing a beacon overload f further up. Um, but then we wouldn't be able to use the tier nine modules on the significant data production. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. Uh, that said, that said, we are clearly not using the full oomph of the uh, significant data production because none of these machines along here are able to output anything because they've produced more than enough significant data already and well, the belt, the belt is full. Meanwhile, and also plot relatedly, uh, Mark has been busy with working with Anchors, so he um, he finished off the he, or he rather he helped Mike finish off this one over here. So this is the one that's providing the power to Melancholia, and you'll remember this sort of pretty pattern and so on that I talked about in the earlier videos this weekend. And then Mark has fin helped finish off a little bit as well because I think probably because uh, Mike ran out of solar panels or something like that. So so Mark was loosely involved here and also built up an additional Anchor system over here in Electra, uh, which is is following the, the very very standard system where you've got this enormous field of uh, of solar. And that's is an enormous field of solar that is between it producing the 60 gigawatts required, well actually slightly more than that, it's producing 61 and a half gigawatts, but it's good to have a little bit of headroom, enough to keep this anchor over here supplied. So now we, we're now up to, I, I don't even know how many anchors we're up to now, but looking at the Universe Explorer and which places we've uh, we've tagged as places that are worth knowing about, we seem to have a Simeus, Kalidus, Electra and Wexovis. Now Wexovis is perhaps not quite there because as you'll remember we, there isn't quite as much electricity available here as we would like so something is being mildly disappointed. Now this, this anchor seems to be getting 60 gigawatts so maybe it's not that. Maybe we're just not putting quite as much power into the energy beam injectors or chambers. I don't know which which thing it is that's being slightly starved. This, although this actually there we go this, this one shows a rather empty electricity bar and if we compare it to the one in Electra actually that also shows an, an empty electricity bar so maybe they are both working and it's just depriving the beam emitter of energy. Who knows? It's, it's kind of hard to tell. But this means if we take another peek at Fenestra, well, you'll see that nothing's happening here. But if I come in, if I come in, I turn the switch on, chonk like that, then after a moment or two, the Stargate will get powered up. You'll see all of the symbols appear, and we, we've, we've done this before. So you, it's, it's not this, this part isn't completely new. There we go. Symbols are appearing. We obviously rotated it a little bit because I'm sure they used to start appearing from the bottom. But there we go. It's booting up. And then once it's finished booting, we can see now down here, we are up to five um, anchors. So I, I obviously missed one. There's another one somewhere that I hadn't spotted. We've got, so we've got five anchors. We've got 
plenty of cooling, and we've got a we've got nothing targeted yet because to target things you need to go in here and you need to um, hit the hit the button like that and chonk. There we go. And that, that one's targeted. But at the moment we don't have the anchors to get this thing up and running properly. Um, I also don't know if we actually have the power. We've got 104 gigawatts. Yes, that should be enough. So if I try and turn all of these on, chonk, 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 chonk. I don't know why that one said not operable. I must have misclicked on it. There we go. Now all of those are turned on and we are using lots of power. But that is now there. Yeah, but there is enough there that they can all be all be selected. And now we've got everything green except that we need another three anchors. And so as I've been saying, that the uh, the requirement for these anchors is difficult because of the absolutely phenomenal amount of solar or some sort of power production required to keep them running. And I've, I've touched on the numbers for this before, but I the, I don't remember what those numbers were. But I do remember that I worked out that putting out all of the solar to power eight of these uh, dimensional anchors was going to require twice as much scaffolding as absolutely everything else in our entire factory combined, uh, which is a crazy, crazy amount. But then they, as I say, they take, they take 60 gigawatts each, which is huge. It's a huge amount of power. Um, so it's, it's, it's no wonder that it's, it's, it's a little bit silly. As a point of comparison, absolutely everything we have on Norvis and Norvis Orbit is using just under 40 gigawatts right now. Um, if we look back over time, we can see that it's at the absolute peak of that was about 59 gigawatts. So at our at our entire factory, well, the Norvis and Norbit entire factories, most power hungry, we were using about the same amount of power as one dimensional anchor, and we need eight of them in different solar systems. So yeah, it's it's a pretty crazy amount of power. And when we did require all that, it was always the laser artillery turrets. Okay, that was <laughs> that was when Tristan and Mark were going absolutely nuts with massive expansion against the biters down on Norvis and using the laser artilleries because they are phenomenally effective, but they're, and they're phenomenally powerful. And phenomenally powerful means they use a phenomenal amount of power. Now apparently we only have 44 of them now, or um, or at least at some point. I don't know whether that's an average or a right now. I think that's a right now because even on on a thousand hours and it, the number is the same. So right now we only have 44 of these. But at the peak, uh, we we had a lot more of that. We had 33 gigawatts worth of them and I don't even know how many that is because only some of them will have been firing at any given point but suffice to say that's a lot of power and now onto the bit that I was kind of teasing you with, with the uh, title card and the initial uh, bit of this episode. Well, Tristan has put together this rather fetching animation using all the different symbols we found in the uh, long range star map. I'm flicking over back over to Factorio for a second. You can see the information we've got here. So you've got all the symbols down the left hand side and then you've got their coordinates. And so he's used those to map each one into the correct position on a sphere. And so when we play this animation, you can, you can see there is a sphere there and all of these icons are in the correct places. So you get a bit of an impression of the areas we've explored and the, or the number that we haven't actually Actually found yet. There's a big open part on this side of the sphere, for example. And so this gives you a general this gives you an idea of what we've found with the long range star mapping. I'm sort of assuming that as we continue with the long range star mapping, then we'll start to fill in the gaps and eventually we'll get a full sphere of coordinates all over the place. And then our sort of theory with that is that in the end we'll be able to come up with something with those numbers that, that maps onto the um, onto the, this vector up here in the navigation log that we found when we went off and investigated the spaceship in Fenestra. Now we're guessing at the moment that maybe if if we do the opposite of this, so the negative of this vector, that will send us back in the direction of home. Um, but there's some experimentation required, probably a little bit more thought. We will see what, how it goes. And, what, and, and the question is, how do you get that vector? Do you sum all of the other vectors together? Do you um, multiply them together because they're all unit vectors with a length, therefore with a length of one? I don't know, but it'll be interesting to find out. He's also produced a slightly more complete diagram here. Then the um, on this one, the smaller icons are the ones where we have a pretty strong suspicion of where those, uh, of, of what location, of what uh, coordinates we're going to get when we when we uh, when we actually find those glyphs those constellations it's not quite we're not quite as sure about this but they seem to be in the right more or less the right place and we've worked that one out by using the information we found in the uh, in the pyramids where for each glyph you find there will be 11 around it and so this has allowed us to put together this map where they're all sort of this is sort of a proximity thing so for example if you look at one of the glyphs in it from a pyramid there'll be 11 around it and these are in approximately the right places one of the things we need to do at some point is compare the two spheres to get together and try to work out whether they're actually quite similar whether the same glyphs appear in the same sort of places on both of the spheres to try and get a feel for if we're getting the same data in two different formats and whether they can be sort of and therefore whether we can use them together to try and work anything out basically. There is going to be quite a lot more thought required to get this into a position where we can actually do anything useful with all this information, but I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll get there eventually. 
And now for my next trick, I shall move on to the sciences. And uh, so welcome back to anyone who is avoiding spoilers. The first thing that's uh, notable here is that we're struggling, science is struggling a little bit at the moment. Um, and at one point, this was because we had a, a shortage of Deep Space One, um, uh, Deep Space One science packs being made over here. However, that seems to have caught up now. And the current shortage, or at least the thing that's currently flowing, is t uh, t Deep Space 2 and Deep Space 3. Well, Deep Space 3 is flowing, Deep Space 2 has essentially run out. And that's probably because we've switched over to doing a mining productivity research which uses Deep Space 2. And we're catching up with Deep Space 3's from a previous research we did. I'm not sure, when we get to the end of this video we'll have a look at what was, what was, what's was what been researched recently and work it out from there. Um, but the reason we're, having, we're struggling there, the limiting factor at that point was the Deep Space 1 catalogues. And in fact, we do seem to have a bit of a shortage of those here, as you can see. And so that's going to cause a problem with the Deep Space 2s fairly soon, because if you run out of Deep Space 1 catalogues, you can't make any Deep Space 2s. Because to make a Deep Space 2, you need a Deep Space 1, and so on and so on. Uh, so, yeah, that, that was causing problems. And I traced that one back, and if we go all the way over to here, and zoom back in again. So over here, yes, here's where we're making the, uh, the, the, um, the, the catalogues. You can see there aren't any coming out. And that's because, well, of the four data cards that are supposed to be going in, there only seems to be three of them. And if we follow this belt back, it comes down to here. And we go, okay, this, the, the, uh, the, the ice cream data down here, no, sorry, snowflake data down here seems to be struggling. And that's due to a lack of nanomaterials. Nanomaterials are made just up here. If we look in here, it's because there's a lack of dynamic emitters, which are made just here and there's a lack of dynamic emitters because we have a lack of quantum processors and that has been a known problem for a while. I've, I definitely talked about this last week but in, as, as a quick summary the quantum processors down here are struggling because we have a bit of a shortage of Holman. No, maybe not actually. We have, what do we have a shortage of now? Um, oh, we have a shortage of Holmium cables so that's sort of related. There's probably, maybe there's an insufficiency of Holmium down on the ground although... I don't know, I thought we were okay for that sort of thing. So let's have a quick look into that as well. And this is how Factorio often goes. You find a problem and then you sort of follow it back to try and work out what's causing that problem. And over here we can see actually there's a healthy supply of uh, Holmium cables. So it's not the Holmium, Holmium cable production's problem. We've got a, a mostly full warehouse here and there's a train ready to go. So maybe there's some sort of logistics problem. Let's have a look over here where they're being delivered to. Uh, no, there's plenty here and they're all going into this warehouse. So there's a train that goes from here up into space to take them all up. So why isn't that one running? Okay. It has, it has apparently arrived now, so it looks like there, um, that we do have a supply of Holmium cables available. They're just not coming through fast enough. And interestingly, we've got two different things in here. Oh no, that, that's data cards which are brought from up here, and the Holmium cables which are brought in on a sort of a single supply train. So we've got, uh, oh and then here's the mixed train with some more stuff. So we do have a nice healthy solid uh, deep space belt of the Holmium cables coming through right now. But, oh, it's just run out. And, okay, over here there is another 500, but that's not very many. So, yeah, we seem to have a severe problem with the logistics of the Holmium cables. We're not able to bring them from the ground up into orbit fast enough to keep up with the demand here. So I guess that means we're going to need to put in another train to bring them up even faster. And then once that's done, um, not the superconductor cables... And once that's done, we can then have a nice healthy supply of the Holmium cables down here. And then, then, well, you can see at the moment, we have all the ingredients. The quantum processors are coming through. But it is, it is a struggle to try and keep, it, to, to, to keep this running. I guess it is just going to mean I need a second train. Uh, what, what else can I do? As we've seen, the, uh, the rate of production is, seems to, is absolutely fine, at least for the, uh, for the rate that the system's currently running at. It's just the, but they're not getting up here. So it's a logistics problem, I guess. So we're gonna have to, yep, have to put in another train to bring them up, I think. And then over here we have, well, we have 41 in the box over here. I guess that explains why the Deep Space Science 1 was running at least a little bit, because if we are producing some, it's just, it's a bit slow and not able to fill up all the buffers we'd like to fill up. Then the trains can keep running. We can keep gradually producing some of the stuff we need. It's just going to be a lot slower than we would like it to be. Also, this uh, scrap here seems to be very, very jammed up. That's a concern. Looking up here, yes, these belts are struggling. And they're all, they're all running very, very jerkily, so they're not flowing nicely. There's an enormous amount of contaminated scrap, which I suspect is going to be the problem. Um, if we look down here, yeah, there's, there are two belts taking contaminated scrap off to be processed. But up here, there is three belts that are mostly contaminated scrap. So some upgrades, maybe, maybe some upgrades down here to uh, bring these up to be deep space belts. We can double the throughput that way. Uh, maybe just maybe and then that, that would allow us to have more processing on the end here if we need it Oh no, and there's an, a further problem along here because we're not able to get rid of the scrap quickly enough So that's making things even worse So yeah, some big upgrades are going to be required for the scrap processing because there is a huge amount of contaminated scrap coming from Well, there's a lot coming from the um, the energy science or rather more likely It's coming from the matter science down at the bottom because I'm pretty sure that produces huge amounts of contaminated scrap And yeah down here you can see there is definitely a lot of sadness happening down here That's going to need a big big upgrade 
And someone's going to tell me that we should have we shouldn't be using a, a belt going at the middle here. We should have a train system or something like that that does it a, a bit more smoothly, neatly, and, and um, reliably. And you're probably not wrong. A train system would have been better, but this is more interesting because we've done train systems in the past. Um, but there is a lot. Of, yes, there is a lot of contaminated scrap trying to make its way through here, and a lot of it seems to be coming from over this way. Is this is this a material science thing? It usually is when there's a, when there's a, a scrap ex excess. Although this belt, this belt here isn't running at all. It's completely full of contaminated scrap and it's just not moving. But the other ones around it are, so it's, we're still getting rid of some of that stuff. Is that because there's a low priority um, connection in somewhere over here? So we've got, yes, here we go. We're prioritizing anything that comes in from the, is this the science park? Yes, this is the, yes, this is the science park. So we're prioritizing all the output from the science park. And that means that this belt is basically not able to run because there's so much scrap coming on or so much junk. Of, of miscellaneous types coming out from up here. So yeah, a big upgrade is going to be needed for all of this. We've already upgraded it to deep space transport belts. So we can't do any more there. Maybe it just needs. Maybe we need even even more belts going along here. But that's something we can look into in the next stream when we uh, want to know why things aren't working very nicely. <clears throat> Ah, I didn't read through all the notes before I started talking, which is fairly standard because, to be honest, the notes tend to be quite long and I can't hold that much stuff in my head at once. Um, but it turns out that Tristan deliberately sent the uh, quantum processors train over from here to the deep space science area in order to unload the quantum process. This is to make the dynamic emitters, to make the nanomaterials, to make the uh, some snowflake cards, to make the uh, deep space one catalogs, to make the deep space one science packs. Yes, it's that long a chain. Uh, so he's deliberately poked the train, sent it over there with a relatively small number. I mean, you can see there's almost 200 in here now. So it's, it's kind of going. It's just not going quite as goey as we'd like it to go. So it, it can be helped a little bit by giving it the occasional nudge. In minor tweaks to try and make things behave, well, I upgraded the belt up the middle of here from a, a space belt to a deep space belt, which means it goes twice as fast. And that means that because we've got, we're feeding a, essentially a space belt in on each side of it here, in theory, if there's enough demand up here, which there almost is, there's more demand than it could cope with when it was just a normal space belt. But in theory, these, these two belts can run absolutely constantly. So if you, if you notice when it starts moving like that, this, this belt is flowing constantly to fill it up because this one is twice as fast. Therefore, half a deep space belt is the same as a normal space belt and so we do seem to have enough for input of these now so we're making the scaffolding a little bit quicker which is a good thing because as I've been saying we need enormous amounts of scaffolding for putting solar on uh, so this is working pretty well we could probably put another machine on the top and make a little bit more or put in a speed beacon somewhere along here to make it make it run a bit faster I, I think that would then push it over the edge to the point where it doesn't work fa fast enough to, or the, where the belts aren't fast enough to keep up with demand anymore however we would then be limited by something that was a little bit quicker and so we'd be making slightly more and so maybe it's worth it I mean, it's close enough that it's probably not going to make a huge difference though so I think we probably won't need to Im improve that any further I do note that heat shield tiles are flowing through quite nicely at the moment. We seem to have lots of them, which is interesting because we have a horrible, horrible shortage of them at the moment. And looking down on Norvis, this area is the culprit. You can see here that this construction is using red belts and uh, assembly machine threes, and generally it's a little bit it's a little bit out of date. Now, some efforts have been put in to bring it up to speed a little bit, but like putting in these wide area beacons uh, with a load of speed modules, but there are only tier three modules in there, and product prod threes in all of these, um, all the machines along here. However, this area drastically, drastically needs upgrading because it's not producing the heat shield tiles fast enough as you can tell by the fact there's only less than half a train's worth in this warehouse here um, all these machines are quite old they've got low tier modules and also even more significantly they are using the old the original recipe the one that takes in eight sulfur 20 stone tablets and two steel plates in order to make one heat shield tile so there is an alternative recipe which takes in walden sulfur four stone tablets and an, ir and an iridium plate to make two heat shield tiles so you get twice as much out for an eighth of the sulfur a fifth of the stone and for replacing a couple of pieces of steel with a piece of iridium so this is going to be much much better much cheaper to allow the whole system to run much faster and more productively however it is going to use iridium and I think we are at a point where we just about have enough iridium and if we don't then things need to be nudged so that we do and so we should be able to rip, well, not, not rip this out and replace it, but build another one, another uh, production area that uses the new recipe. And then once that's up and running, we can then drain this area and stop using the old recipe just because it's so, it, it, it's so much more expensive, particularly in sulphur. And one of the big problems with it is because it requires so much sulphur and so many stone tablets, you end up with very, very high throughput belts along here. And it's still not, and, and you're just struggling to get enough of the ingredients in there. And you, you'll notice along here, there's quite a lot of red lights on these, on these machines in the middle. So a lot of these are not running because, well, we're using red belts for 
goodness knows what reasons, and so we just can't get the sulfur in quickly enough. But if we did upgrade those belts to be green, purple or green, or even blue ones, we then probably find that we weren't able to pull the sulfur out quickly enough. And you can see here that even though sulfur is something that in theory we have plenty of, and if I select this station, you can see, well, there is a, there is a, there is a train on its way to sulfur drop, which may well be this sulfur drop. In fact, I think it is. Yes, it's about to put, it's about to pull in here. But despite the fact that we, we're calling in trains to bring the sulfur over as we want it, we're still using it up faster than it's being brought in. And so everything up here is going to be running even more slowly now because there's less sulfur being brought in. So you can see what I mean. This this whole area is not really fit for purpose. It's got it's been upgraded a bit, but not fully. And it's now and it's still using it's using old tech. It's using an old recipe. It's using too much of resources. It's just it's just not good enough. We're going to need to build an upgrade, an improved version of this somewhere, and then things will hopefully be much much better, and we'll have a nice healthy supply of, of um, the heat shield tiles. And also, you know, we'll have chucked away a load of unnecessary machines because if we use uh, product high, high tier productivity modules, high tier beacons and high tier speed modules and high tier if assembly machines then we'll require a lot less machinery around here and therefore everything will run a bit more quickly from a UPS point of view and it'll save us 0.1 or 0.01 UPS on our level that has dropped all the way down to 30 already. And that's, that sort of thing is why big oil that was filled up, that originally filled up basically all of this area down here then turned into small oil which is this area here. Um, yeah, that's quite, that's quite a big difference, and because over here we've got the wide area beacons with the tier 6 speed modules in it. We've got the advanced chemical plants over here doing all of the cracking. Uh, now granted, we are doing a little bit of the production, so the sulphur is being made on demand by these machines here, which are then just feeding it straight into a train. So, so this little area up here isn't quite all of the new, the new oil processing, but the, the, it's so much smaller, even, even with the stations. If I take a copy of this, just to just to demonstrate my point, even with the stations and the stacker, I reckon you could probably fit this in about probably about twice into the air, into the area that was that was previously doing the oil processing, which is essentially most of this area around here, um, and most as I say, most of that is stations. And I think that's one of the things you get with uh, space exploration. And we noticed it in Industrial Revolution 2 as well, is that as you start to get later into the game, more and more of your towns start to be absolutely dominated by stations. Uh, this one up here, was the was, was, this was quite an early one. This was Module City that was built by Mike. And as you can see, this, this is dominated by stations, but that was quite un unusual at the time. And even then, there's still... The, the, the area of assembly machines is still probably a slightly bigger than the area taken up by the stations. But then over here, we've got what, what's going on here. This is producing solar panels and one of... Uh, no, this is just producing advanced solar panels at this point. Uh, and this is dominated by, by, the, by the stations dropping off all the ingredients. And you see that sort of thing everywhere. The, the, the newest iron production system over here, for example. Yes, we're making lots and lots of iron and steel here. And then we have an enormous number of stations to get to, to take that product in and out. And a massive stacker on the side of it. And um, this one, granted, this one is bigger than normal because we have have the system here we're feeding through the ore from many many different sources but even so even without that it would still be much larger or we do have another set of stations over here ah yes this is bringing ingots over and then chopping them up on site to turn into plates for the one or two places around the universe that still require plates and actually these steel plates here it's quite likely that they're being taken over to the um, to the heat shield production over here because this is old enough that it's yes it's still asking for steel plates instead of instead of bringing in steel ingots and chopping them up on site. So you can see what I mean. There's a lot of a lot of um, tweaks and changes and upgrades and modifications and improvements that can be made to all of our systems around here. And this is the sort of thing that Mark's very good at, and he's done a lot of our new and upgraded builds because he has the attention to detail to go in and and build something that is uh, op well optimized and generally. And usually, generally aesthetically pleasing as well, and just a, a nice, neat production system like the uh, like the iron smeltery over here. Um, and I think he quite enjoys doing that sort of thing as well. Whereas some uh, some of us, are, uh, some of the other ones of us, like going out and well, maybe maybe killing biters or maybe just going out and making enormous tangles of spaghetti to do something new and weird and wonderful. So yeah, we 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 work quite well as a team. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of the things that you would expect one particular person to have been doing, Tristan has improved the train for the uh, heat shield tile transport as well by uh, by adding boosters into it. So it's got it's got the motors and the batteries and so on now. So it will transport the heat shield tiles around a bit quicker. However, if, if there isn't a train's worth of them in the station, having a faster train doesn't really help. So there's a little bit more upgrade needed in there as well, I think. Back up in space, Mark got fed up of me complaining about there always being a shortage of productivity modules, and so he realised that the reason it was so bad was because we were trying to feed uh, this machine here, which requires an enormous number of um, of what is it, vitamin lange extract. It requires 120 vitamin lange extract to make every single one of these modules, and I had it coming in on a half belt that was being shared with these these modules that are coming in here, much like all of these other ones. But down here, that was a problem because this is this was the um, the weakest link in the system, and so he's upgraded it. We now have a, a solid 
belt, a single space belt, so 45 per second, being brought over here, dumped into this machine in order to make the tier four productivity modules a bit more quickly, which means we can make the tier fives, and well, we can't make the tier sixes because as is traditional, we have run out of Vitalic Reagent. But you know, it's a big step in the right direction. So <laughs> there's, there's been a big improvement over here. We just need a li little bit more, um, a little bit more Reagent in order to keep this system running. Although it does have a certain amount cached in here, um, but that means that was the last one. Oh well, you know, it, it, it is trying and that's the important thing. And in order to try and provide all that Vitamelange extract and Vitalic Reagent and all the other Vital Vitas, Mark has also put in some more Vitamelange mines out on uh, Big Red and you can see here, I don't know if this is a new one or not, but it's been put, it's been, clearly been put in after this belt was here. And so now there is even, even more Vitamelange being brought into the processing systems over here, which can then in theory churn through it, although these seem to be stopped. Is that because we've got an excess or something? Yeah, we seem to have enough Vitamelange roast or spice or whatever this, this stage is called. Come, uh, we, as we come up here. Uh, I see we're, we're using the stuff from the core mining by preference, that makes a lot of sense, and we're doing that with circuit conditions on the on the belts up here that tell those to stop when this warehouse is more than a certain amount full. And that means all of this area is running like, like the absolute clappers. Over here we are presumably trying to, yes, we're producing uh, Vitalic Reagent at a decent speed, and that's being passed over to a warehouse here, and then all flooding, flooding off to go into the spaceship. Uh, because as, you, as you've seen, we're using a lot of that up. And actually, the only one that's running at the moment is the Vitalic Reagent. The epoxy's fine, even even the extract seems to be fine. We've got enough of that that's been passed through into here already. There's, well, there's 2,000 sitting in this warehouse waiting to be put in a train. So, yeah, it seems to be working quite well over there. Mark has added in an additional uh, glass train on Norvis. I don't, I, I, I don't know where those are feeding, but apparently there is so much demand for glass that we just couldn't keep up. So we've stuck in another one of those. Excellent. And he's upgraded the belts in the solar panel production again. So apparently we're still not producing these solar, these advanced solar panels quickly enough. Now, right now, that appears to be due to a distinct shortage of um, oh electronic components, which is due to a shortage of lithium. Okay. Well, the problems get pushed back up the chain, but in theory, if we, if we have a good supply of everything, then the system can run a bit more quickly and effectively. Um, but as you can see, dis dis despite the upgrades, it it's still struggling a little bit. Why is there yeah, why is there a lithium shortage? Let's have a quick look at that. So lithium's being produced over um, here, this one, yes, and that. Stone, there's stone going in, and there's a bit of lithium chloride. Oh no, sorry, this this one, this is the upgraded part. Uh, yeah, there's, there's stone coming in here, and there is lithium coming out over here, and it's going into a station, and there is there's a decent amount in there. Maybe we need another lithium train. Well, where is the lithium train? It's on its way to a drop-off station. Okay, so it's going to drop it off at the bus, by the looks of it. Yeah, I think we might need another lithium drop train because we're struggling logistically rather than productively. We have enough lithium in here, as you can see, the uh, the, the warehouse is mostly full, more than. 80% full, but we're not transporting it around as much as necessary. So, like I was saying just now, with we, we need it, we, we needed apparently needed another glass train. Now we need another lithium train because we can't transport that around in, in large enough quantities. And finally, Mark says he's upgraded the belt out the output belts over here for, for getting rid of the scrap from the mirror production. So you can see this as this as this dribbles through. There is a lot of scrap that we want to want to dispose of, uh, and so he's upgraded all these belts to uh, deep space belts, uh, so we can get rid of this scrap a little bit more um, effectively and efficiently. And here we go, all flows up here, and then it's going to try and join the massive traffic jam up here. So um, we shall have to see have to see how that goes. Although actually, we, we seem to have a priority on that. Um, uh, I'm not, it looks apparently that was set by me as well. Who, who knew? Uh, so this is this is going to be getting rid of the scrap quite effectively and just blocking up everything else while it does so. So um, good, I guess. <laughs> And finally, we get on to the the, uh, the sciences we've been doing during this uh, during the last stream, and we've done another long range star mapping. That was number twenty two. So, yep, that's another one ticked off the list. We've managed to we managed to scrape together enough astro science to get that one done. And as you can see, this has been using tier one and tier two of the deep space science packs. So we've been churning through quite a lot of those in order to get that one up and done. We have researched the planetary teleporter, which is not completely useless. I mean, I guess we could use it for transporting ourselves around on some of the bigger planets if we wanted to, but I don't see the point, really. We've got jetpacks, we've got navigation satellite, we've got trains. It doesn't take a long time to get around, uh, so I don't think we'll... I mean, we might build a couple of them just for the novelty value, although those are expensive. Maybe we won't be using those. They're an interesting idea, but I think at the point where you unlock them, they're not actually that useful anymore because transport is more or less a solved problem by now. So I can't see us actually making any of these, or at least if we do, it will just be for the, well, here is a new toy, let's have a play with it, see what it does. 
We have invented Thruster Suit 4. So this is an upgraded version of the Thruster Suit. It's really expensive to make, but you know you only ever need to make four of them in theory, as long as you don't go and get yourself killed. And even then, actually, you can usually recover it from your body. So yeah, they're really expensive, but they will give, presumably they'll give you a bigger inventory. Is that going to be the main selling point of them? So you get an inventory size bonus of 60 and then a grid of 16 by 16, compared to the tier three, which gives you an inventory of 50 and an equipment grid of 12 by 14. So it's a significantly bigger um, equipment grid, and it'll get you an extra row in your inventory as well so that's that's kind of tempting I could see I could see those being useful and, uh, and wouldn't certainly wouldn't say no to having one uh, that said given the cost of them I probably won't bother f at least for a while because yeah I mean we could afford it I could go around and grab all that stuff but it's not it's certainly not a priority the, the mark 3 that I have is probably good enough especially given that I don't do all that much stuff in person these days we have researched an intergalactic transceiver and the description here says it uses a micro black hole machine allows instantaneous communication with any other transceiver anywhere in the universe so presumably that is a communication device like the signal transmitter signal receiver but for some reason it requires deep space science 3 in order to unlock it I'm not sure what, quite what that's for, when you would use it, why you would use it over a signal transmitter. Um, we may need to do a little bit of investigation to try and work out why on earth you would use it. Um, it's fairly expensive to build, especially those AI cores in the middle there. Um, yeah, I don't know what the point of that is, given that the, given you've got the other things. Maybe in Crastorio you don't get signal receivers and transmitters, and so this is their equivalent, and for some reason it's been stuck way off in the in the end game. I don't know whether to blame Crast or Arendelle for that, but it's, it, seemed, it doesn't seem useful at this point, put it that way. And then finally, we're working on mining productivity 13, so every time you do a drilling operation you get a little bit more out of it, sort of another an extra 10% or something like that. These are great to have, it makes all of your mines work better, they're phenomenally expensive, you can see that 35 5,000 there, and it's using the Bio 4 uh, science packs as well, as well as some of the some of the other ones, uh, some of the other advanced stuff as well. So yeah, they're kind of expensive, but they're nice to have, and it's something to keep the system running and, and keep it doing science if we're if we're short of say astro or energy for doing the for doing the other ones that are sort of the more core things. This is now an effect. Of, this is now a functionally infinite research, even if we haven't actually technically got to the infinite part of it yet. So there are a few others that are a higher priority, like the transceiver, for example, is, is something we would like to do. We quite like to do more long-range star mapping, but that's for the plot thing. I think everything else here is either an infinite or a functionally infinite research. So we are very, very nearly there. Oh no, we need to do the spaceship victory at some point. So what does that require? Oh, that. So that will require us to do the transceiver. So we are going to need to make an intergalactic transceiver, and. Who knows? We'll have to. So that is get that. If given this, this requires a sort of an, an active transceiver. That's an interesting one. Um, it looks like it's just a thing we build and then it goes ping, and then we can then we can do this one. And then once we've done that, we can unlock this at least unlock this research, um, and then be able to go off and do the uh, do the nexus thing. We're not going to do the nexus thing because we don't want to trigger the the uh, the victory condition in, uh, this way. We want to trigger it the other way. But we will, will at least do the research here that we, you can see in order to get that unlocked um, out of a sense of completeness, if nothing else. And so that brings us to the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching. We'll be back on um, well. This one's going. This video is actually going out a little bit late. So we were we were back yesterday, Monday, with the uh, with another uh, K2SE stream, and we will of course be back next Monday as well, carrying on. There will be a satisfactory stream on Wednesday, where I should be carrying on doing all of this, but in three dimensions. So come along to that one, please, if you like. If you'd like to see a bit more of a, a bit more of my content, and then at the weekend we'll have the usual catch up videos, and hopefully this weekend life will be a little bit calmer. I won't be going away, and so the videos will come out at the normal times. So, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Please make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss the next ones. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.